So, um, gosh, in 2008, right in the beginning of the Obama administration is when I started at the federal government. And if you remember, remember that last recession, two recessions ago? <laughs> Wasn't that a delight? Um, so what was really unique about that recession is that everyone was underwater on their mortgage, right? Like housing, it was a housing crisis. And so we were sitting there with the Fed saying, well, how do we help people? Everyone's kind of stuck where they are. Traditionally, in economic crises, people could kind of leave where there weren't jobs and move to where there were jobs, right? It just like basically, who had to suffer through reading The Grapes of Wrath in high school, me. Um, so, not a Steinbeck fan. <laughs> sure, <sorry>. Oh, really? <laughs> so, um, so, we were like, well, we, should, we need to figure out how to help people where they live now. And so that started this whole thing called the Place-Based Initiatives. And so the National Endowment for the Arts stepped up with 18 other federal agencies. And we use this term creative placemaking. It's not a perfect term. It makes it sound like there wasn't a place there in the first place. I get it. But um, after doing a ton of work, we kind of fig like funded a bunch of stuff. I'm not going to go into all those details. But we kind of realized that there are strategies that artists and creative people and a role that they play in making making place. So um, here's kind of what it can do. I'm not going to go over this whole slide. You can take a picture of it. Um, but generally, it falls into the buckets of strengthening economic development, seeding civic engagement and belonging, which is, I think, really important right now, <laughs> right? Um, can help build resiliency in communities. This was something that we found that was very unique that we didn't expect. I mean, we found that communities that were engaging with artists after crises, who thinks there's going to be more weather crises coming up? I mean, uh, that those communities recovered faster. And then also, as everyone knows, the arts contribute to the quality of life. Who wants to live life without Beyonce? Not me. Um, people usually laugh at that. My God. <laughs> you really are tired. I'm tired. <laughs> OK. Let's <laughs> uh, so see if you go to the next slide, please. So, so sort of how does it do it? Um, I promise these are the only two slides with text. So it can. Anchor in a community, like we're sitting in a new community, artists anchor in a community. These become places where artists do work with community and interact. The big, you know, access to the building is just as important as building is as important as the building being here. Artists can also actually activate places in a multitude of ways. They can help change the narrative. Um, they can do all kinds of social justice work. They, I don't like this term fixing because it makes it sound like a community is broken, but we, you know, just look at the murals that are all over this city, right? It, beautification matters and it helps people feel like they belong in a space. And also, a, a lot of things that people didn't surprise us too was that artists really have a role in the planning process for the future of the community. Who's been to a bad community meeting? Anyone? <laughs> we watched like Parks and Rec, like the meetings on that. Like, community meetings are actually worse than that in real life. And so, um, we were finding that a lot of communities were working with artists to make that better, and I'll show you an example. So I just want to say all of the work right now has to be done through an anti-racist frame, just like beginning and end of story. There's no way to, to not be doing place-based work and not be looking at it through the lens of race. It's just absolutely essential, period. And um, if you go to the next slide, uh, something that we're, I, I'm very interested in now in post-pandemic is Pandemics change the world, period, right? If you're in any study of history, we are not going to be the same on the other side of this. We're still in the middle of it. And I think it's a chance to change some of our orthodoxies, right? It's a chance to shake some, can I cuss? Shake some shit up, you know? And artists have a real role in that. And artists have a role in helping make the change we all know needs to happen in our community. So I'm just going to show you a couple examples of some things we've funded um, across the country um, from the endowment. One sort of local here. Who's been to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania? Anybody? This is, OK. And what's it famous for? Steel. steel right? Yeah, the, the steel for the Empire State Building, the Statue of Liberty, was built in Bethlehem. So the Steel Stacks is closed. Um, and it's actually a small arts organization with not a bigger budget than the Clay Studio. It's actually been working to really revitalize that area. This, so they've built a performance space. If you go to the next slide. Fussy. Um, the NPR station and PBS station for the area has moved onto the site, and they do a bunch of other, if you go to the next slide, um, a bunch of other programming there. The NEA actually funded this piece of public art, which is a three story um, piece of steel that has the names of all the buildings that were built on it. It lights on fire. 
anybody's ever had to get something approved through a city process, you can imagine getting a piece of public art that's going to light on fire approved. They, this tells you how ambitious these people are. Okay. Uh, this is another amazing example of Kunkui Initiative. This is an amazing design organization out in California that works in the immigrate, the primarily a community of immigrants that live here, and they had absolutely no public space. So this is an example of a small anchor in a community, designers and artists working to create a place where the community can gather. This is also a place where many of the women in the community can now sell food, so there's sort of an entrepreneurship aspect to this. Very simple design, but it is a, tr a true community anchor. just wanted to show examples of some pl planning policy work. Um, this is an awesome organ dance organization in Maryland that uh, worked with the local transportation authority to host public meetings. This is a public meeting about the future of a highway where people are acting out what they would like to see happen through dance. Uh, this is, uh, okay, how long do you think it takes to get a business license on the Navajo Nation? <laughs> Just take a guess. A year, much longer. If you're part of the nation. If you're part of the nation? That was the time. Yeah, if you're part of the nation, yeah. How long? Three months. A year? Longer than a year. Two? Five years. Seven years. Wow. Living out in I moved here from Arizona. It, it's incredibly eye-opening to, to, work, to work with the uh, indigenous communities out there. This is an example of a project we funded. Um, I don't know if, I won't go into the whole thing, but indigenous nations are separate nations that live within our nation. When you give grants to them, you are doing a nation-to-nation -nation negotiation. So we, they came to us and said, we have got to untangle this policy. And so uh, we hooked them up with some designers, Navajo designers, who came and um, did this whole community process with them to try to really untangle what it means to start a business uh, on the tribal lands. Um, this is an incredible project. I encourage you to go look at it. Um, they were able to reduce that time down to three years, which is really incredible. So um, I'm, I'm not doing that justice. This is another interesting organization that works with women coming out of prisons in California. Um, this is an artist that realized that when you come out of a prison, you're just dropped off with 20 bucks and you end up right going right back into prison because there's no resources. So they're designing this bus. They worked with the women and they, they're designing this bus that when you get dropped off, you can get right on this bus. It'll help you find housing, food, provide you more money. Um, this is an incredible woman, Deanna Van Buren. I encourage you to look at them. They're designing equity, designing justice. I will shut up. I'm just trying to give you a, a sense of the scope of the incredible work that creative people are doing across this country. Uh, this is in Phoenix, where I just came from. This was an act, some activating projects. This is an interesting organization, like a clay organization that works in quilts that designs these ground murals, mm -hmm. which is very cool. Um, they also had really cool food parties <laughs> on the street. <laughs> Um, and this is, uh, this is a really incredible project. I don't know if you know um, her, Alexandra Bell, who works with uh, newspapers and sort of tries to work to change the narrative of the way that people of color presented in newspapers and then goes and puts these up all over uh, communities. I encourage you to go look at her. She's really amazing. And just if you want to know more about this, there's so much out there now. Like organizations have been funding this work now for almost 15 years. If you go to the next slide. Let's say you're interested in doing work on equity, you can go look up this guide on equitable development from PolicyLink. If you're interested in doing it with parks, you can find one. If you're interested in doing one public safety with uh, transit, there's so much knowledge out there right now. I encourage you to go to a website, creativeplacemakingresearch.com, and that will help you find a lot of this, this material. Okay. I'm just going to stop there. No, this was just a picture of what's kind of been going on. <laughs> so, that was amazing. Thank you. But, uh, and I just want to say this, it's, I have tried to enter this community very humbly. I don't know a lot about Philadelphia. I've only been here a year and a half. So enough from hearing from me. Let's hear from our incredible local folks who really have been doing the hard work on the ground here. So, Carolyn. <laughs> uh, well, I think I was asked to share more about the organization than I share about what I've personally been doing in the community. Um, so yeah, it's been around for 46 years. We are in our uh, institution, it's bilingual. Um, the one thing that I'm always asked when I'm approached by parents of uh, non-speaking Spanish, do you allow other kids from other races into your program? And I said yes. I get that every single day. It's mind-boggling that people actually think because we're Puerto Rican, we're allowing only Puerto Ricans to attend our building. 
And I get discouraged when I hear that. And I want to share that this summer we are going to open up for 60 plus kids and half of them are African American. And I'm super proud of that because it hasn't happened in the Tallers uh, system. Um, and I don't want to say it's about me, it's about the way you communicate with the community. And I am a person who's out there hustling every day to, and I'm connecting with communities on, very level, on various levels. And when you were sharing about getting money and equity, I'm happy to hear about that because um, my master's degree is in community arts. And when I say community arts found me, and then I went back to school. Um, my bio, um, I am a, a single mom of a one child. Um, and when I say that I think most Latino kids are set up for failure, um, I was not that child. I'm the oldest of five. I witness a lot in my life. I have an addict stepfather who showed up in front of us all the time. I never understood why, why we lived the way we did. But education saved my life, especially the arts. Because you go to school, you're, te you're bilingual, you don't speak English. The teachers just kind of pushed you around to these ESOL classes that made no sense to me. Um, but the arts saved my life. And I've been drawing since I was six years old, and I draw every day. It's really important to me, and I push that in my kids. Um, I, it took me eight years to finish college. I went to Moore, my daughter's at Moore. In between that, my first marriage fell apart. My husband became abusive. The second time around, um, I met a beautiful person in my life. It took me 10 years. And by the way, he's in the back hiding. Um, <laughs> um, I uh, want to say, I also had to take care of my grandmother. My grandmother lived for almost 200 years old. And I had the opportunity to go back to school. And I went, I went and got my master's because of the phone of Sario. The Fongo Sari invited me to be part of community arts programming. And I just loved his approach. And I did um, his community arts as a, an assistant to him. And I wanted to do it and teach at a university level, which I haven't quite gotten there yet. It's one of my goals, but I'm working on it. We're hiring. Um, <laughs> huh? We're hiring. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, <laughs> after I got my master's, my, I went to Micah, guys. And you know, Micah is hard to get into. I was the, I want to call it the valedictorian of my program. And the irony about it is I have to get, give out uh, an honorary master's degrees. And guess who the recipient was? Mm. Pepe Mosario. Oh, wow. So it was just irony how the whole world just fell everything into my place. Um, I had to leave my home because I did leave my home for two years. And my partner over there to stay home, take care of my son and my grandmother. I kind of commuted a little bit, but I, I really enjoyed going back to school later in life. I be, kind of became the godmother of everybody in that program. <laughs> um, I mentor all the time. I'm helping out all the time. The one thing I do want to share, because we didn't mention this community, is the community of the homeless and the opioid. Opi 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 I can't even say it. Opioid <laughs> community. I, I taught there three years ago. I know many people in the street. I open my doors to all of them. We all should be helping everyone in our community, no matter what struggles, what income, or what race. They're welcome into our building. I help them as much as I can. I, we have a resource wall that's amazing. And when I sit, I sit in about 10 com committee meetings in the city, I do. When I was invited by Clay Studio, I was honored. Because this whole approach about this whole thing when it was put together was amazing. I love that they reach out to the community. We got to engage in art. I mean, how many people sit in Zoom meetings? We're not even making anything. We should be creating while we're doing these meetings. And that should exist on going. And, if you, and I know, I know, I know for a fact that everybody's on that Zoom and not showing their face. And they're probably doing it, messing with the phones. We all got to do something with our hands. We just can't sit there. So, um... I don't want to keep talking because I could talk a lot. But, um, <laughs> I'm going to show my work real quickly. I didn't realize she was showing my work. Yeah. Okay. Let me go back. Uh, this is actually one of the pictures of the opioid community. This young man, I tried to help him 10 times. Mm -hmm. He is still surviving, living in the street. He is a product of what the city has done injustice to, to the people on the island. He came from Puerto Rico. You remember the year when Puerto Rico sent a whole bunch of people here to get better? He's one of those victims. So this piece was in, our, in, the, in the Barnes Museum a couple of years ago. Um, when I was at school, I, I was dying to be fibrant, and I finally did it. I created a bird, guys. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And this is a piece that I kind of told myself. I'm a big recycler as well. So all that wood has been outside. I clean it up and I create. And I, I was carving the piece. I have prints if you're interested because I am making art. I'm trying to sell some prints so I can make some money for my mouth. I got to fix my mouth. Mm. Nice. <laughs> And that's me doing outreach because I'm constantly out on Saturdays. You see, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Next one. Oh, let me go back because I was doing it before you. Oh, were. I'm sorry. I didn't no, know it's okay. Doing. I just I wanted to. All right, this was really important to me. Um, I work with um, the Brother Bridge. If you guys are not familiar, Brother Bridge is an organization that works a lot with immigrants, and they're especially women that are obese. So this quote was put together by a lot of women and families from shelters, um, and then. We uh, had this big anniversary event and we presented the equipment. This quote should be traveling the city. I'm not sure yet because I haven't been with them in a while. Mm -hmm. But it was really important. Kids have fun. That's one of the events I did at Michael last year, probably speaking. And I recently read the paper and I didn't even know it. <laughs> so um, this one right here, you guys, if not familiar, Kensington Voice is a newspaper in our own community. Um, I have a friend that um, works directly with the, the street, and she just opens up her table, they draw. So these are the drawings on the rows from the people in the street. Mm -hmm. So the art became, um, it's a fashion term, uh, survivor of the uh, streetwear from the, of the survivors. Mm -hmm. So this whole line is being sold. If you're interested, reach, me, reach out to me. It's not my line. I supported another friend in the process. She reached out to me, do you want a model? Do you want a model? So I brought my daughter along as well, and we model outdoors. It was really beautiful. It was funded by the New Yorks. Yeah. And this is another part that, this is a, a cross that I did. Um, it's pretty old. I call it, what, what if? What if Christ did drugs? Will we exist today? That's the question I pose all the time. It has some ranges, yes. And sometimes people just be shot. This cross is right now in the missionary Kensington and hand cut and diamond. Yeah. I'm a recycler. All that is made of foil, brown paper bag, and found pieces of wood. Yeah. The servant just to clean because my grandmother was a diabetic. Yeah. Uh, and this is my latest campaign. You all know we have a serious problem with trash and cleanup. Mm -hmm. So right now, a whole bunch of uh, community members right now, we form a committee. And we're called D3 Dumping. So look for us. We're going to have a social media platform soon. This is us preparing our, uh, our aprons. We have logos. Phase two is for us to create a play and bring it out. So we're doing a, a, a mock play, but we're making it fun about the trash and how it needs to be gone. I think that's the last piece, right? No, oh, no, my nails. nails. Okay, I have to talk about my nails. Yeah, that's that's they are fabulous. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Okay, this is a big treat for myself. I just turned 60, guys. Talk louder, Marilyn. <laughs> so, if you know me, you know I always have nails. Mm -hmm. And people always say, how the heck do you do art with your nails? Mm -hmm. Very easily. If my hands get dirty, I'm going to wash them. And I still teach to this day, and I always teach high schoolers, and some of the girls come in really fancy. So I said, listen, if my hands can get dirty, your hands can get dirty as well. That's one of my biggest teaching speeches. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the ones I did a few weeks ago. That's amazing. I think, I think there's one the, more. Well, I got one more? One more. Oh, that's uh, our trash monster. Uh -huh. We're all putting the outfit on her. And this is my home, because it looks like the color museum, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's what my friend Daniel told me. I don't know if it's true. It is. Because I've been to your place. <laughs> but I tell you, it's not true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> And that's it for me, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Michael. Please share your wisdom with us. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the Color Girls Museum was founded in 2015 uh, by Bastide Dubois. Um, it's located in Germantown in a 142-year-old um, Victorian uh, that at the time was actually her family home. Um, we, when, you know, when we tour the museum, we always talk about how um, the museum is unique. We reference it as being the only one of its kind uh, because of the specific gaze uh, through the eyes of 
uh, black and brown women of the diaspora and uh, uh, its commitment to be a public ritual for the protection, praise, and grace of the ordinary, extraordinary color girl. And that, that, that emphasis on ordinary is uh, very specific and intentional. Um, you know, we, we know that Oprah will have a museum someday. She should. Uh, Cheryl Chisholm currently has a museum. Um, Michelle Obama may have a museum. But our focus is, is who is recognizing, who is elevating, who is uplifting ordinary black women and girls who um, do so much in this, in this culture, in this society every day without um, any reference, any um, um, conscious uh, acceptance or willingness to recognize what their contributions are. And so uh, with the founding of the museum, we said that now there is a place that really concentrates, and very intentionally so, on um, um, recognizing the contributions of those women. Um, the museum, in this, I think it has a very unique approach, particularly in terms of, how, uh, of what its purpose is. I think we recognize the power of art as a catalyst. And so uh, we uh, imagine the museum as being a vehicle to address and also to bring to the attention um, issues that, that may be uh, relevant to the community of the ordinary, ordinary extraordinary color girl. And so um, since uh, uh, 2015, we've had about seven, eight different campaigns and our approaches to um, promote a campaign annually that in some way uh, provides an opportunity for uh, redress and dialogue about a, a specific issue or, again, something relevant to uh, her community. And so, for instance, our first show was called Open for Business. Um, in that particular exhibition, we envisioned a museum as uh, bed and breakfast that was disguising itself because if uh, folks thought or knew or understood that it was the Color Girls Museum and what that meant, then um, she might be in danger. Um, a second show was uh, um, A Good Night's Sleep. And in A Good Night's Sleep, we consciously looked at the uh, impact of sleep disparity on um, uh, black women and girls in particular, but in that whole related community, and uh, really referenced uh, um, um, research and, and data that talked about how sleeplessness really impinges and impacts uh, health. And so we invited artists to, in a sense, contribute to the museum um, work or thoughts or um, insinuations that um, reference sleeplessness and how they are coping with sleeplessness. Um, uh, the next show was Urgent Care, a social care experience. Uh, urgent Care was a direct response to the election of our previous president. And uh, so we, in that, for that particular exhibition, we envisioned um, the, or reimagined, I would say, the museum as a first responder and invited artists, again, to uh, uh, submit work that they think in some way uh, contributed to the environment of the museum serving that kind of purpose. So all the spaces in the museum for urgent care, social care experience, uh, repurpose themselves as, say, spaces you might find in an urgent care, uh, a reception space, uh, an intensive care space, a triage space, um, a uh, historical record or, or record for, um, that, that would be valuable and useful for uh, folks who came to the museum. Uh, the following show was uh, In Search of the Color Girl. And in In Search of the Color Girl, we um, thought about the myriad of ways that um, black women and girls show up as missing. You know, missing because so there's been some uh, catastrophe that, in, in a sense, have eliminated them from uh, this uh, particular plane of existence, or missing because they're they're simply erased. Uh, their contributions are not recognized, 
or they left because they had to get out of the environment that they're living in. Uh, all the different ways that, that again, um, you can be, in a sense, missing because you're not present in your community and you're not able to perform or work or um, be active or real in the, in the sense that, you know, all of us take as an expectation. Um, the following show was to that was um, Toni Morrison, the songs. And in that particular exhibition, we pivoted with the death of Toni Morrison uh, to play, um, pay rather tribute to her legacy. And we invited artists to submit works that they felt related to a quote from one of her books. Um, so uh, each of the spaces in the museum, and there, there are eight different spaces that we uh, consistently curate, was named for one of Toni Morrison's books. And uh, the artists uh, uh, submitted pieces and just gave us a sentence for why they felt this was uh, um, uh, relevant to a particular quote that they selected or a quote that we had made available for artists to uh, contemplate when they were choosing work that they wanted to submit to the museum. Uh, the show that we only got the tour for one month uh, was um, that show, Toni Morrison, The Songs. Um, and so in a sense, in a real sense, that really became our pandemic show. Uh, and uh, we didn't open for 18 months uh, after the pandemic. And then we uh, actually just opened in September, past September, uh, with our current show. Um, and uh, we actually have been on a two-week hiatus. So we'll be reopened in June. So uh, if you're in Philadelphia and you get the opportunity to, um, uh, be sure to uh, check us out. Um, but uh, this whole notion of using a museum uh, as a, a, a catalyst and as a way to uh, provide dialogue and, and to pro provoke uh, actually questions or or just to really, again, to um, address the gaze that we're really um, concentrating on. It is the gaze of uh, black and brown women of the diaspora. Uh, what are their concerns? What, what are their, um, how can a museum in a community space uh, provide this kind of service? Um, am I fine then? <laughs> I mean, it was also so beautiful. I'm like, I'm not stopping. I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a lot. It's a lot more I could add, but I, I, I was trying to be really conscious of the five minutes. I appreciate that. We do want people to be asked. So maybe there'll be things in the questions that I, I can provide more uh, context and uh, information about. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelly Schindler. I'm with the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage. We are a regional funder focused exclusively on supporting all of the wonderful arts and culture here in our city, in our five county region. I feel like my job here today is to be a booster for our community and to, um, it must be a grant maker thing, show you more slides of all the amazing things happening here in Philadelphia that speak to the idea of place, of which I wanna call out the Quay Studio for the fact that we are all here today. Thank you so much for inviting us and for giving us the space, a third space together that we're in here to talk about ideas and placemaking. We uh, first had started having conversations with the Clay Studio when this was a figment of the imagination. So just to be here in this concrete building right now is really special. And I wanna give a shout out to the whole staff here for making it happen. Here. So um, let's see, where to start? I think about our work at the Peace Center as both catalyst for cultural production and also risk capital for new ideas, case in point, this room, this building. And one of our, uh, you know, we have uh, our longest running program, our artist fellowships, of which Roberto Lugo, who made the mural on the side of this building, is a recipient in 2019. And outside of that, we primarily fund projects. So thinking about uh, the work of the Peace Center, our relationship to creative placemaking and third places, 
I thought I would focus on a lot of the projects that we supported over the years to give you um, some ideas of some exemplars that we see here in our community, several, some of which will be really familiar to the Philadelphians in the room gathered here and also online. So I'm going to cycle through these kind of quickly, but just to give you a sense of how we can think about place and placemaking in our community and, and what that in turn sparks to go back to what you were talking about, Michael, in terms of conversation, dialogue, presence, absence, there's so much we could unpack. This is Hank Wells Thomas's Philly Block Project, which captures the iconic landscape of row houses and their inhabitants here in Kensington, where we are now. And he brought these images. This is actually vinyl wallpaper that he brought into what used to be known as the Philadelphia Photo Arts Center across the street in the Crane Building that has now been renamed Tilt. So this literally was, he brought the community inside to the galleries and then in turn brought the, the inhabitants of these row houses into the galleries who could spot out what they were looking at and it was this real amazing patchwork of people and place together in space. Monument Lab um, is a surprise to no one here. They, in this initial project that they did in 2017, Monument now is its own organization but it started as an exhibition project across Philadelphia. They commissioned incredible contemporary artists, many of whom are based here, to produce outdoor responses to the animating question, what is an appropriate monument for the current city of Philadelphia? So here we have City Hall, Hank Wells Thomas again, who's from Philadelphia, hence the connection. Karen Olivier in Germantown. I love this piece so much. So this conversation was really installed across the city to create all of these third spaces together. And then we have Saigon Chan's Fireflies, which created a pack of illuminated pedicabs that carried passengers up and down Benjamin Franklin Parkway. The Recycled Artists in Residency Program, otherwise known as RARE, they, um, it's an artist residency at a waste stream site in Northeast Philadelphia. So here is a project where they had, they established an archeologist and residency program to examine the items and goods found in the waste stream there on the site and learn more about where our cast off goods and materials come from and what they say about our Anthropocene era. So this is a little dinner party in the dump. They're, they're also, this is a residency that's run by artists. So everything they do is imbued with an accent with a sense of art, art for sure. Kelly, who's your mom? My mom. <laughs> <laughs> Symphony for a Broken Orchestra, Temple Contemporaries Performance Project. Love this project so much. This gathered hundreds of broken instruments from Philly public schools that were just cast off, unable to be played, brought them all together to the gallery at Tyler, and then uh, these were then turned over, adopted by artists and musicians, both amateur and professional, to then... Um, uh, perform. This is hundreds of musicians performing in the um, Park Avenue Armory uh, a couple of years ago. And then at the end of the performance, uh, Temple Contemporary then created a kit to repair these instruments and return them to the schools and the students. It's like poetry, completely. The Women's Mobile Museum with Zanelli Maholi. Uh, also, a project done by Philly Photo Arts, now known as Tilt, across the street. Uh, this is a project that connected 10 femme-identifying Philadelphia artists with South African visual artist Zanelli Maholi, who you see here, that's her work, or their work, in a residency and exhibition initiative that toured to several spaces, including Dixon House Community Center and Point Breeze. This was in the gym at Dixon House, and this was installed on Election Day in 2018, so it was a pretty powerful experience. I have a lot of Kensington representation in the slideshow, I realize, which is a good thing. So Kildray's Castle, this is a lesbian feminist haunted house organized by Canadian artist activists Allison Mitchell and Deirdre Logue and hosted at Icebox Project Space, also in the Crane Building across the street, right around um, both election time and also Halloween. And then this was a processing room where you could process your experience together to complete the circle. Then... Um, up north in Elkins Park, we have an installation and suite of performances created by Philadelphia artist David Hart at Frank Lloyd Wright's only synagogue, Temple Beth Shalom in Elkins, Elkins Park. He actually, this is an artist who lives in this community and is a way to bring awareness both to this archi um, architectural marvel and also um, to the community. Activating these spaces that haven't been activated. Hidden Lives Illuminated is a, was a series of animated films uh, created by currently incarcerated artists projected onto the walls of Eastern State Penitentiary and screened for their families and the public. It was a whole series. 
It also, uh, placemaking can look like this. Performances by dancers from the iconic Trisha Brown Dance Company in Fairmount Park. More row houses. This is Row House Workshop, an interactive exhibition at Cherry Street Pier, showcasing the singular personalities of four different neighborhood row house blocks by the architect and Pew Fellow, Brian Phillips. This is actually a shipping container into which he also did a vinyl installation that was activated with questions and conversation um, with uh, visitors. It can look like Staying Power, an outdoor art exhibition in the Fair Hill Heart Trap neighborhood not far from here, organized by the Village of Arts and Humanities and curated by Monument Lab. This is a project that asked inhabitants, what is your staying power in this neighborhood in our rapidly, city cha rapidly changing city and world in an effort to understand, amplify, and invest in the neighborhood and its residents? And I think of this organization, the Village of Arts and Humanities, as kind of an iconic placemaking organization um, that's a real um, a d gem and important to Philadelphia and beyond. We have Unity at the Initiative, which was Asian Arts Initiative's multi-site exhibition and indoor skate park celebrating the work of Bay Area artist Jeffrey Chung and queer trans artists of color in Philadelphia. This is a great pandemic project in which they actually created this indoor skate park that you could um, book an hour in and go and skate on any kind of wheels you could find. The Ongoing Heat Response Project, organized by the Trust for Public Land, which I saw made an appearance in your slide, Jason, too, engages community members in Fairhill, Grays Ferry, and Southeast Philadelphia to create public art addressing the question, why should we care about urban heat and what can we do about it? This is an equity that disproportionately impacts low-income communities and impacts their health, safety, and daily lives. So this is a citywide project anchored in these three neighborhoods that's looking to increase awareness and um, advocacy for, the, for this issue. Up right now, we have Pool, a social history of segregation at Fairmount Waterworks. I encourage you all to go see it. It's, it's an extraordinary project. Um, in the decommissioned pool underneath the waterworks. So it's your big chance to be able to see this space. It actually flooded during the hurricane and then they had to completely remount the show. It's extraordinary, it's not to be missed. It's up through September. And this is a project that explores the history and implications of segregated swimming in America with the goal of deepening understanding of the connection between water, social justice, and public health. Truly important project. And we have this forthcoming Mashra Baya project at the Center for Art and Wood, um, a, a fellow medium-specific organization uh, that used to be your neighbor in mm -hmm. Old City, Philadelphia. This links the heritage of the Mashra Baya, an ancient screening element integral to Islamic architecture, to considerations of art and design in contemporary life. And they will be producing an interactive structure on site in their gallery that will surely inculcate a third space. And I'm just going to end. This is kind of... Uh, an infographic from Art Place America, which was a 10-year placemaking initiative that sunsetted in 2020. And they produced a slide. I mean, it's super dense, but there's so much we could talk about here. Highlighting 13 ways that arts and culture can support equitable community development, which perhaps we can dig into in our conversation together. And then I just want to say, you know, in the creation of a third space, all of these projects I mentioned here, which to be clear, represent literally a tiny cross-section of all of the amazing work happening in our community and of course of which we add the wonderful work of both the Color Girls Museum and Tayer to that list. These all produce the conditions for connection and engagement for people to talk to one another, consider and debate urgent and sometimes difficult questions, and to look at place and how we gather together. They create what I think of as new agora, new publics, that bring us together for a purpose, to challenge us, to think about also absence and who's missing from these conversations, to surface forgotten or misunderstood histories, and to invite community participation in real and pressing issues. We both have the privilege and the responsibility to participate as culture workers, as neighbors, as citizens. And in a time in which we've spent more hours in our private spaces, in our homes, apart from each other, more time than ever during this ongoing pandemic, we need these third spaces, both in real life and increasingly by necessity online to make such connection possible. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, I know we have a limited amount of time left. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't going to cut anybody off because I was just in there going, I want to go to all these projects. Um, let's get real. This has been hard. 
the last few years? Who thinks it's been hard? Who thinks we're all a little traumatized, right? What is the most critical role do you think that creative people need to play now, creative organizations? Like, one of this, as I understand, is that the Clay Studio wants to be meaningful to this place. It wants to enter humbly and to do its work in the right way. So, what's the most important thing to focus on right now? Like, what now, right? After all this, what now? I'd say uplifting our community. Say more. Um, Play Studio is here, but I'm pretty sure most of the people around here don't know who Play Studio is, especially in the community outside of Front Street or maybe even up further behind. Um, getting going out there, I believe in outreach. Outreach is so important. Uh, just talking to the people in the street or just in general in a supermarket, letting know that we exist, we're here to serve you. Come join us, talk about events, even though we did a lot of those events. We did a few when we were putting all this together, mm -hmm. which I thought was really beautiful that Clay Studio did that. I think we need to continue that and keep going. I know sometimes it can be exhausting, but we really need to make the effort. <coughs> and we need to push the schools to really enforce the arts mm -hmm. because this whole country is really traumatized in a sense, especially our little ones. This becomes so normalized for them. It shouldn't be that. Mm -hmm. It should not be that. Thank you. Michael, do you want to? I know it's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think uh, if everything you said, and uh, definitely to, um, particularly as an organization, and particularly as a museum, we do ask ourselves what what should we be doing, or or what can a museum do, uh, for instance. And uh, our response is that a museum can do or be whatever you need it to be to serve the needs of the community. And I, I think uh, that whole notion of reimagining um, um, the space and concept of what a museum is and uh, how it operates is uh, central to um, you know, our mission, but I think it also uh, allows us or gives us space to respond to uh, you know, the times that we're in. That's great. Thank you. Kelly? I'm thinking a lot about care and how we can care for one another, how we can care for our colleagues, our communities, you know, um, how we can make sure s our staffs are okay, you know, the people we work with. Um, I, I think the pandemic has created such a rupture for how we, uh, there's no business as usual anymore, right? And so how can we work more thoughtfully, maybe more slowly, and really think about what matters and, you know, um, your question about how what we should and can be doing, I think, is so important. You know, thinking about tone and relevance, and um, you know, what's the priority at a given time. And I, I think um, that's something that I don't know. I feel like we can't. Maybe that was taken more for granted before, as we all just kind of like went about, you know, everything we were doing all the time. But it's just not really possible anymore. I feel like we have to show up in a different way and and really think about. Um, and how to do that every day. Well, let's let's stick with this idea of care and mm -hmm. healing because I'm very I'm personally interested in this idea of mm -hmm. uh, healing engaged community development right now, mm -hmm. trauma informed care. So I'm wondering if you guys can use examples from either projects you've funded or projects you've done where you felt like there was a healing element that might help guide us going forward. Mm -hmm. I think um, we well, you know, at the museum we can't we. Karen to say that um, we're putting a cure back into curation. And so right. it just, oh my by, God, the, I love that. It just by the element of uh, how we curate. And I left out in that quickness that, um, that uh, one of the most unique things about the museum to me is the, uh, it, we, we reference it as, as a memoir museum. And so uh, we curate along with the art, uh, objects, artifacts submitted by, um, who we reference as ordinary extraordinary. So these are, again, black women and girls of the diaspora. Um, this could be something as simple as uh, their grandmother's comb or mirror, or um, I'm thinking of a doctor's bag that another uh, uh, um, friend of the museum submitted because it was her father's and he was one of the first OBGYNs in uh, Oakland. And it passed to her sister, who tragically was killed in a domestic violence issue. 
so so uh, um, incident rather, I'm sorry. And so just uh, and and she entered that into the museum for the purpose of healing for our urgent care social care experience uh, exhibition. So the notion that you can, in a sense, through curation or through the objects along with the art, create this kind of space um, that can be healing. I think uh, very oftentimes when we're um, conceptualizing exhibitions, we are very constantly thinking about what will the impact of this be? How can this serve a person that is healing? So it's interesting that you ask that question because that's something that we do every time we uh, think about uh, uh, mounting a new exhibition. For me, um, I've always approached healing in my art projects, in personal and also pushing the teachers. Right now our theme this summer is called Latinx on some heroes. And what I have asked every teacher is to research heroes in the Latino culture as African American as well. Um, but I wanted to take it to a level where they got, get a list from the kids. It could be it could be a face a person, a grandparent, a grandfather, an uncle, uh, and just research their personal relative and talk about them because it's a personal hero to them. In the process, you're healing as you're researching and thinking about this person. But I'm realizing what I also notice with our kids, they're angry. They don't know how to cry. You got We got to educate our children back to show emotion. And crying is okay, accepting, especially boys. Like they're ashamed because they cry. No, you should not be ashamed at that. It's something personal, it's deep, and you should express yourself. So me, our program is really important in trying to reach for the kids and educate the teacher as well in that process. Um, and being mindful on how to approach the whole process when you're teaching art. Kelly, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm thinking about kind of two different approaches here in, in the work that we support. I've seen it both in terms of, you know, how projects are designed and, uh, and different methodologies that are deployed. So, for example, you know, in community engaged pro projects, having them be artist-led and having them be really process-driven. So there aren't a lot of outcomes articulated at the beginning, but it's really through the process of working together that goals are set, values are articulated, and so forth. It's really in, you know, an emergent process. So I see that. I also see it actually more and more in um, um, archive development and collections care. So looking at um, especially more vernacular collections that are being explored through different projects. Um, digitizing of those works, getting them out of artists' uh, garages or attics or basements, you know, really giving care to these, um, uh, these um, objects that otherwise, you know, um, won't stand the test of time just due to their, like, you know, fungible materiality, right? And then I think in terms of um, what we can, what we have been increasingly supporting and what I think our, our panelists really value in the process are, you know, care given to collaborators and participants, so including child care and budgets, you know, that's something that we're seeing more, you know, we support a project called Designing Motherhood that, you know, is all about care, right, and caregiving, and so that was intrinsic to their budget from the get-go, you know, um, especially being run by a, a primarily a group of parents. Um, also, uh, the Women's Mobile Museum project that I mentioned actually employed a psychologist for the participants to help them process their experiences and to make sure that they were being really thoughtful about engaging with those individuals. Um, and of course, always paying artists and community organizers for the time, really valuing everyone's contribution. Thank you for that. I love that you brought up that the kids are not all right. The kids are not all right, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I run a college. I do want the to share. Challenges I do big. want to share that yeah. three of my teachers are our therapists as well. When I select my teaching staff, I'm very um, selective in the process. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure they're nurturing to our students and understanding where they're coming from. Yeah. They don't have to be. They don't have to live in the community. The teachers. I just want to know they have a beautiful background and good heart, mm -hmm. and they know how to approach the teaching process. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, we have about five minutes left. Questions from the crowd. We put nobody to sleep, so that's good. Oh, good. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, it's kind of in between your question and your comment, but back to here, mm -hmm. I think what um, this disruption of the social fabric really pointed out to many people who we'd always have been kind of going along and being able to be with people, go to restaurants, do this, go to the museum, 
So I've seen the very importance of doing what we're doing right now in different ways of making connections. And I think connections can help, you know, build community, obviously, but um, I think there's a huge problem, like as you mentioned, anger and loneliness and not feeling heard or seen. And I think any, any, any art that can help process that would be really great. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions or comments? These are some very smart, there's a lot of wisdom up here. So. <laughs> Yes, back there. Yes, I, I'm going to stand on a strong way you just referenced about trying to do more outreach and trying to connect with people. Without this question, art has a way of, of, of impacting and affecting people and affecting people emotionally. In my own opinion, I just think that when we sit back and look at communities as they are today, they are not like they used. We knew our neighbors. We knew Miss Jones. Miss Jones knew us. Anymore, they were tangible, real people. We seem to have lost that. One of the programs that just read about not long ago, a program with Philadelphia Police Department, are providing cameras out to the organizations to get them to go out and, and do outreach, if you will. And I think that would be a great thing. That would something that should be expanded across the city. It will enable people to get to know their neighbor. Now they become tangible real people as opposed to some object out there and you lose sensitivity with them so there's no regard to that. And I think that if there are things that you guys can do and with funding that you have, if you can expand on those kind of things, I think that we will see a much closer relationship in their personal relationship and respect them and caring for people. And that could have an impact on this community overall. Thank you. That's happening now in one of the communities. I saw that yesterday in the news. That's happening now in one of the communities. They're helping seniors. They got this grant. They went inside, helped the seniors fix their house. And it was a bunch of young people. So I guess you have some new grant to put out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, project I, like I, 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 I always encourage um, for any of us to get creative and maybe send submissions or what type of grants the few foundations should put up. I think it's a great idea. It's great. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've been thinking about what I just heard and what I've been thinking of an article that was in the Inquirer that spoke about briefly about car jockeys in the area and how fearful how widespread they were, and the fact that really there was a, a mob group that was doing it, but a lot of the work was done by kids who were done their first at 12, 13, 14, and that was the, the statistical increase of it through the pandemic. Is it was bored, there's nothing to do, they were tired of having to walk somewhere or take a bus or whatever, and so they steal a car, a car jack, just for fun. I'm thinking of this, and they showcase few kids whose names they could say do it now who are now in programs and wondering about certainly it's a vast deep pocket of more attention and money but a yeah. connection of art within the community for at risk areas with kids who are at risk any child at that age middle school thereabouts who has no place to go doesn't have a job you know school is remote they're bored for tears they're not doing stuff that is how and what kind of programs places like you or others are looking at that creative place making mm -hmm. um, to reach those kids? In a sense, it's what art in schools used to do when kids went to school, mm -hmm. but you sort of disintegrate from that stage to a point where there's a large section of certain areas of the population that aren't being fed in school <coughs> and growth and so forth, and are just falling through those cracks. And, and the statistics, I don't remember them all in the inquiry art, but it's Frighteningly astounding to see the number of youth juveniles who are becoming quote delinquent, clearly it's a felony if you do it, and they get older and one guy has a gun and that's it, they're all locked up. So I'm thinking that it's a yeah. problem of everywhere we're going to feel like it's affecting children in essence. 
so how art, like, through all the concepts you're talking about, address that, if there's stuff going on already. Yeah, I think the question, just for the folks online to be able to hear, is basically, um, what programs do you sort of currently exist? And I know there's probably a zillion. Right. <laughs> if you could mention a few to really help with, uh, you know, our youth that are feeling very disconnected have been traumatized right now. So if you could just speak to a few of them, I think that'd be great. And we should, we'll wrap up. So. Okay. So I don't know if you guys know this, but Norris Square has a program for juvenile detentions right now. Um, the unfortunate thing about the, that, that program, uh, the turnaround is crazy. And by that, I mean, they get, they get, they're there for a few weeks and they move on to the next cycle. Um, I don't think there is accountability to the process. That's been my view. I've worked with the Juvenile Detention Center. I did it for five years. Um, when I had the conversation with the young men, because they were young men, um, their thing was they don't have a place to live or they can't go home. And there were, some of them are getting in trouble on purpose to have a place to sleep and to eat. This is why some of our young people are getting in trouble. And it's the honest truth. If your mom is not home or the grandmother passed and you're being passed, passed by um, DHS and foster care, our foster care system is not well. They also need some serious help. Um, and that's the honest truth. They're getting locked up so they can have a place to live. And I actually don't know what to say today. I try my best to work with young people. But the city really needs to step it up. Thank you. My clerk. Sorry, brought the conversation off of it. No, 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 it's no, okay. It's fine. No, 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 it's a, look, this is, so we all have to look very clearly about what is really going on in our community if anything's yeah. going to change. So that the truth is not harmful. Um, can I one more thing? The yeah. gentleman back there made a good point. When I was growing up, Doña Anna over there, she was screaming her lungs out. Yo, your, your child's not doing right. Mom gave her permission to come pick me up by the ear and bring me home. And this was in the 70s. This is not even a lot anymore, because if you touch a kid, you get written up or whatever. It's the truth. We have to go back to our traditional ways, but with a lot of respect, get to know our neighbors and get to know our kids. And I think in the process, if we all do that, we could probably help save this community. And Philly needs to be saved. Seriously, all this gun violence, a lot of these young people, we really need to do something. Michael or Kelly, do you have other examples you might want to share? Uh, the museum has the girls program uh, to engage uh, girls in the Germantown area and the Great Philadelphia area. Um, and uh, it takes a different form each year. Uh, the last year it was to create a podcast, so it's a whole group of programming and training around uh, podcasts and media and culminates in a project like a podcast. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what the program at is will be this upcoming year, but uh, we usually broadcast it uh, on uh, social media to uh, That's great. Yeah, I'll just um, mention a few organizations that I think are doing really interesting work with youth in communities. Mural Arts has a million programs that are engaging um, youth, youth in all sorts of workforce development programs that are um, um, connected to the arts. So um, I know that um, Jane Golden, the founder of that organization, talks about how Tariq Trotter was one of her, um, um, one of the youth that she worked with when there was um, an anti-graffiti initiative in the city that then turned into mural art. So that's one of her founding narratives, which is really fun to think about how that organization and, you know, he's evolved. Um, uh, the Village of Arts and Humanities, um, they're, they have a current project in which they are, um, they've developed a curatorial fellowship for neighborhood youth to um, learn the ins and outs of um, gallery work. They have a new gallery on site in one of the buildings that they've redeveloped. They have a whole economic development arm of that organization that's all about deep place making, right? So they, um, they're thinking about pipeline and how to um, do some work, uh, uh, job development training um, to um, keep youth connected there. The Trust for Public Land, who we've mentioned, um, also in creating um, parks and playgrounds all around the city. They're a national organization, but they do have a hub here in Philadelphia. So a lot of their work is about um, greening communities and creating um, um, uh, spray grounds and playgrounds and all sorts of ways to um, um, create some joy and happiness and some green space for for um, residents. And then um, Pepo Nasorio did a project about the closing of a school called Reform several years ago. 
um, which was all about kind of, um, it was a testament and homage to the school that closed because of these issues that we're talking That's about. Working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was, you know, again, turning poetry, you know, um, or creating poetry from a very um, kind of heartbreaking narrative. But that was a way to um, give voices to the students that were there at the school, too. So I think there's so much art that can come out of this. It's not the solution or the answer, but I think it gives us a lot to think about and ways to kind of influence and um, spark policy in ways that maybe, you know, the day-to-day -day can't sometimes. I want to give a shout out to one other program at uh, Temple, um, uh, called the Youth Employment Project, and it's a project uh, um, created, that I had created actually at the center that I formerly worked at uh, for too many years. <laughs> <laughs> Jen just wanted to jump in. I just wanted to add that we are starting an after school program at the Glade Studio. It'll be um, beginning in the fall intentionally for you know this purpose to give students after school a place to come, do homework, feel safe, make art. Um, Fleischer has a teen lounge that is similar. And I think what's obvious from the conversation is that there are many, many creative people in the city who are. They have ideas, they are putting together programs, sometimes on a shoestring, and what is needed is not, is, is more funding, to be perfectly honest. Like, there are lots of people who are already doing the work and they're, they need support. Okay. Um, I know it's a hard moment. You are all here because you care. This is not the moment to give up. This is the moment to lean in. There are amazing people doing amazing things in this city. Help them. Volunteer. I think what you're hearing here is that it's going to take all of us to fix this. You know, we got shattered, and it's going to take time to rebuild. You're here because you care. You voted with your feet today. Don't stop voting in many ways. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you to our amazing panel. Um, that's the time to call. <laughs>